All right. So uh, once again, everyone, uh, uh, welcome to this El Nino uh, and climate update for FMG. Um, this is something that um, uh, hopefully will help you to prepare for the uh, weather that you might experience in the months and seasons ahead. Um, my name is Ben Knoll, and I'm a meteorologist here at NIWA. I've been working uh, with NIWA for almost eight years now. Uh, and before that, I worked in the United States as a meteorologist with AccuWeather.com, a pretty popular weather uh, outfit there where I did long-range forecasting. Um, so uh, here in New Zealand, I lead NIWA's Seasonal Climate Outlook, which is a once-monthly outlook uh, looking three months into the future, things like rainfall, temperature, um, soil moisture, river flows, and um, covering off things like El Nino and the different things that drive New Zealand's climate. Uh, so in today's presentation, uh, we'll go through a couple of different steps. Um, so we'll have a quick look back at the what has happened over the course of uh, the last uh, few months in terms of uh, soil moisture and, and the, new, the New Zealand drought index. Uh, and then we'll look at how El Nino is tracking uh, and what that means for the climate in the coming months uh, and seasons ahead. And that will comprise the majority of the presentation. We won't spend too much time uh, looking back um, sometimes uh, I think you know, all of us are aware of what's kind of happened in our region or on our farm, on our paddock, um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, we know what has, you know, happened and we know best for our specific area. So um, with that, we'll do a quick review of the climate conditions. Um, now, some of you may have seen uh, present similar presentations in the past, but really today it's kind of an introduction. Some of this material may be new for you, and that's all right. Um, what I'm going to do is, is uh, you know, take, you know, some time to go through what the different uh, plots that you're looking at are, what they mean, how they can be interpreted, uh, and then, you know, perhaps the next presentation or the one after that as we uh, go down the line, it becomes a little bit more intuitive, and that's the idea here. Um, so NIWA has a variety of ways that it measures the current state of dryness and drought. Um, and what you're seeing on screen now, the left-hand image here, uh, is what we call the New Zealand Drought Index. And it's kind of like a one-stop shop for uh, measuring the current status of dryness uh, and drought across the country. And it has uh, five different categories from dry uh, to very dry, extremely dry, uh, drought, and severe drought. So this enables us to kind of track in near real time um, the state of play across the country from a dryness and drought perspective. And pleasingly, at the moment, um, there's really not much to be seen on this map. It's, a, it's a nearly a blank map, aside from this little patch of yellow near East Cape, uh, which kind of denotes um, a, a small area where conditions have been uh, dry enough to kind of trigger the first tier of coloring on this map. But really, um, the conditions at the moment really aren't that that, that bad across the country. Um, one of the inputs to the drought index is soil moisture. Um, so on the right-hand side, we have soil moisture as a difference from normal. Uh, again, a real-time um, analysis of that. And this takes into account all of the climate stations that NIWA has across the country to kind of build that national level picture of um, soil moisture. And anywhere you see the uh, green or blue shading, uh, that indicates either normal or above normal soil moisture. And there's quite a few regions at the moment that are experiencing um, either normal or above normal soil moisture, Northland, Auckland, Bay of Plenty, uh, the east coast of the North Island, and much of the South Island. There are a few exceptions to that general rule, uh, including that little hot spot near East Cape where we just looked at, uh, as well as uh, parts of western Waikato and northern uh, Taranaki, uh, as well as Nelson Marlborough, um, parts of Wellington, uh, and then just some small pockets down in Southland. Um, so overall, uh, the soil moisture picture is certainly not dire at, at, at the moment. Uh, we've had enough rainfall recently to kind of keep the soil levels, uh, moisture levels elevated. Um, so uh, this is kind of useful context as we review, um, uh, start to look at what's likely to happen into the future. And with that, um, we'll move uh, toward climate drivers. Um, so when we uh, mention the climate driver, uh, we're talking about um, who is basically at the steering wheel of, of Mother Nature's car. Um, what is going to influence our weather patterns in the weeks, months, and seasons ahead? And one of the key ones for New Zealand is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. 
Uh, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation has three phases. There's El Nino, um, there's La Nina, and then there's Neutral, uh, which is neither uh, El Nino nor La Nina, kind of the middle ground. This year, um, we have uh, an El Nino event in the Equatorial Pacific Ocean, and that's what I'm uh, annotating now, uh, is this area thousands of kilometers away from New Zealand um, where we track the status of uh, El Nino in the ocean. And uh, despite it being quite a distance away from New Zealand, it is um, a very important piece of the climatic puzzle uh, when we look to forecast. It's, um, it explains about up to about 25% of New Zealand's climate variability from season to season. So it's not the full pie, but it's a pretty big piece of the pie. And critically, it is the most predictable piece of the pie. Um, and so forecasts uh, are skillful six to nine months into the future. Um, and we can use that information to drive the climate modeling that we run to better understand how that will filter down and flow down into Aotearoa in New Zealand. And this year, um, the key monitoring region that we focus on, uh, forecasters focus on, is called the Nino 3.4 region. Uh, and it's kind of in the central part of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and, and this year, uh, right now, that area is 1.8 degrees Celsius above average uh, as of the latest reading. And once you get to about 1.5 degrees above average in that region, that's when we start to call it a strong oceanic El Nino signal. Um, and it's been above that 1.5 threshold for a, a little while now, um, dating back to uh, uh, the month of October. Um, so we've been sustained um, in that kind of strong oceanic El Nino territory for some time. Uh, and as that kind of persists and continues, uh, it's likely to kind of start to play a, an important role in the weather and climate that we experience here in New Zealand during summer and autumn. Now, El Nino is not just measured in the ocean. Uh, there is an atmospheric component to measuring uh, ENSO as well, and that's called the Southern Oscillation Index. Um, so uh, certainly a lot of the farmers that I have spoken to over the years um, like to use the SOI as um, one of the key measures for um, uh, for ENSO in our region. Um, and that's because uh, the SOI uh, draws information from uh, pressure, air pressure readings in Darwin in northern Australia and Tahiti in French Polynesia. Um, and it's described by the difference in air pressure between those two um, zones. Uh, when the Southern Oscillation Index is positive, we tend to have La Nina-like patterns. And you can see very clearly these blue colors here, uh, which constituted the big triple dip La Nina that we had between 2020 and 2023. But more recently, we've seen the Southern Oscillation Index start to trend negative. Um, and that is a sign that the atmosphere is starting to respond to those changes in ocean temperature uh, and that the atmosphere is trending in, a, in an El Nino-like direction. And it was a little bit sluggish. Um, after three years of La Nina, we did see the atmosphere kind of struggle to uh, start to respond in a typical El Nino-like fashion. And in some respects, we actually are still um, kind of seeing that, um, that kind of coupling, as we call it, uh, not really fully um, kind of established in a New Zealand context. We've had a lot of variability in our weather patterns. Um, and I think an element of that is uh, kind of heading out of this triple dip La Nina, the, the ocean system had a lot of momentum that was on the La Nina side. So it's taken some time to kind of break through and kind of get ourselves um, in, into more of an established El Nino-like um, pattern. Now, kind of another um, element of the El Nino that we have this year is that um, it's happening uh, with the global context of very warm ocean temperatures. So what I'm showing you uh, here at the top of the screen is the ocean temperatures in October 2023, uh, 1997, and 1982. And those years were picked because they were strong El Nino episodes in the past. And in fact, 82, 83 that summer and 97, 98 were very significant impacts uh, El Nino years for New Zealand. There was drought conditions across uh, many regions. Um, 
But it doesn't take a meteorologist or a climate scientist or a rocket scientist to kind of see how things are very different in the year 2023 and that there is warm ocean water, not just in the kind of equatorial Pacific Ocean, but in the Atlantic, in the North Pacific, near Europe, in the Indian Ocean. These areas um, were not that unusually warm in those past El Nino events. And that is kind of the uh, illustrates how our climate and our oceans are changing and warming. And with that kind of more widespread heat that we were seeing this year, it kind of spreads out the energy. Uh, so instead of focusing right on the equator, uh, like we had during, say, 1997, 98, uh, what we see is kind of it splays out and it kind of kind of focus on other regions of the globe. And what that can do is introduce a little bit more variability in the weather patterns that we experience. And in some ways kind of make this uh, El Nino that we have uh, more maybe non-traditional compared to those past events. And this is going to be very important, I think, as we go into summer, is that if you are on your farm or you've been farming for a long time, say more than 40 years, um, I, I don't think we're going to see, you know, a uh, carbon copy, let's say, of 1997-98 or 1982-83. And, uh, and part of that is to do with the warming of the oceans that we have seen. Now, in terms of the duration of this uh, El Nino event, uh, the bottom image here shows the uh, probabilities of La Nina conditions, neutral conditions, and El Nino for uh, all the way uh, through winter of 2024. That's the very last row. Um, and we can see the probabilities here uh, at the top uh, are all 100%, and that takes us through the summer season, December through February. And then as we go into autumn, uh, still seeing a pretty high chance for El Nino's continuation, uh, 88%. So it does look like uh, this El Nino event is going to have a bit of a long tail. Uh, so the impacts may well linger in through the first half of 2024. I wouldn't be surprised if we're still seeing El Nino-like effects maybe lingering right up until the start of winter. Um, so... I think this is to say that even if um, you have had a, reason, a good amount of rainfall and your conditions are doing uh, pretty well on your farm, your paddock, your region at the moment, it's kind of um, an idea to not get complacent and really stay ahead of, um, of the game here uh, because there's a long way to go with this uh, El Nino event. Right. So uh, the, the, the third kind of prong of today's presentation is going to be the uh, climate outlook. And this is kind of really, I think, the meat and potatoes of, of today. Hopefully some of that uh, um, uh, kind of foundational information was interesting and useful. And it gives you an idea of some of the things that we look at behind the scenes because it is a pretty complex picture. And we only covered off El Nino today. There's a lot more that influences New Zealand's climate, things that happen in the Indian Ocean, the Southern Ocean the Tasman Sea, all of these things play a role in the climate outlook projections that you're about to see over the back half of this presentation. So I, th I first thought um, it would be useful to start off with almost a, a bit of a weather outlook because um, if you are watching this in uh, you know, mid-November as it is now, um, and you're kind of, you know, seeing quite a bit of soil moisture around, still a lot of moisture around your farm, your fields. Um, there's actually more to come. Uh, so uh, it does look like here in, in mid-November, which uh, takes us through about the 20th of the month, the image that you see on screen. Uh, this is one of NEWA's five-day models, uh, and it looks at rainfall accumulations across the country uh, through about the 20th of, of November. Um, and it does look like those areas that we were looking at earlier that had some locally drier than normal soils are due for some rain uh, over the coming days. So um, I'm not seeing any sh short-term risks for, say, a flash drought uh, or, or a very unusually dry period kind of developing uh, over the, say, last seven to ten days, the, la the back half of, of November, um, as we still we have had and, and still will continue to have at some level these semi-regular rainfall events, um, in this case coming in from the Tasman Sea over the course of, of the weekend and into next week. Now, as we look further out uh, into the future, we kind of have different tools on our belt for different jobs. Um, uh, 
Now at NIWA, we have a, um, a model that goes out five weeks into the future, uh, and that is called NIWA 35. Um, and NIWA 35 is run once a day, uh, and it looks at um, rainfall patterns and the, and the risk for dryness and drought over the next five weeks. And this is a brand new tool um, that we've worked with MPI to develop over the last three years, really on the back of that 2019-20 drought. Um, and it's been a lot of effort and collaboration and input um, from the sector, from the agricultural sector, um, forestry, horticulture. There's been a lot of um, uh, uh, kind of industry engagement toward developing this tool. And now it's out there um, for, for everyone to use, and that's, that's really exciting. Um, and it's been a, a really cool to be a part of this, um, as it hopefully will keep um, New Zealand kind of ahead of, of, of the game in terms of monitoring risk for dryness and drought, uh, as well as the other side of the spectrum, uh, the risk for heavy rainfall and flooding events, uh, not just, you know, this summer, but many summers into the future. Um, so I think this was a, this is a very useful tool. If you have not um, looked at it quite yet, uh, the link is on the top of the slide here. Um, and this tool updates each and every day around 2.30 p.m., give or take, with a very fresh view of the outlook for the next five weeks. And when you land on the tool, you're presented with um, – uh, three different scenarios of uh, the potential for either abnormal dryness or meteorological drought over the next 35 days. And uh, the, the middle scenario is kind of the most likely scenario, so that's kind of a good starting place. Um, and what we see, if you were to go to the drought tool right now, is that there basically is uh, – no, no real risk for meteorological drought to develop over the next five weeks. Uh, and that's kind of um, a testament to the recent rainfall that we've had, um, as well as an expectation at some level for some rain to continue. So it's kind of looking like um, the risk for dryness and drought this side of Christmas is – uh, not that high um, at, at the moment. So uh, while we may track, as I kind of uh, go to the bottom right of this slide, uh, in a drier direction in the coming weeks for some regions, the risk for that to culminate in a drought event this side of Christmas does look to be pretty low uh, for, uh, for much of the country. And I should add that when we look at, at meteorological drought, it's not just a forward-facing view. Uh, wh what we do is we take in the last 60 days of observations, and then we couple that with the next 35 days of forecast information uh, because drought is something that develops over a long time period, sustained reduction in rainfall, um, and, and then soil moisture, and that affects the hydrological situation. So um, in order to model that, we have to look back as well as look into the future. And there's a lot of different uh, plots and maps that you can look at on this tool. Uh, one of my uh, favorite ones is the week-to-week -week rainfall trends, which um, you can see at the bottom right of this slide. Uh, and basically it shades uh, – it's an average across each of the next five weeks of rainfall um, as a percentage of normal. And the brown coloring indicates below normal rainfall. The green coloring indicates above normal rainfall. And as we kind of take a, you know, step back and look at the next five weeks, it's still a bit of a mixed picture out there. I mean, there certainly are some weeks that favor uh, 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 some dryness, uh, as such as uh, week two here and week three, maybe even week four. Um, but there are some signals across some of those weeks for some moisture as well, some of those that I'm just kind of circling now. Um, so when I look at this, although there are some weeks that certainly do favor dryness, um, I don't see that, you know, from week one through week five. We do see some variety in there, uh, and that gives me some confidence that, again, we're probably not going to be um, rushing into, let's say, a meteorological drought um, this side of Christmas. But um, it's really, you know, useful to look at this day to day to see the changes and the trends. Um, so definitely bookmark it uh, if you haven't so far.
Right. So now we're going to start to look a little bit further into the future. Um, and to do that, we have a couple of different tools. Um, uh, NIWA's kind of public outlooks are called the Seasonal Climate Outlook. Uh, this is the project that I lead um, and have led over the last several years. And when we look out, in this case, three months into the future, it's not about what the weather is going to be like on Christmas Day or Auckland Anniversary Weekend. We don't have the ability to do um, that detailed of forecasting that many that far in advance. But what we can do is use the climate drivers to understand what broad patterns we uh, may experience uh, with with more frequency over the coming uh, months. Uh, and that's kind of uh, tied very closely to the El Nino that we were uh, looking at and reviewing earlier. Uh, so what you see on screen here is our latest seasonal climate outlook for covering November to January. Uh, these update at the beginning, around the start of each month. So we'll be issuing our uh, December to February, the official summer outlook, um, right around the 1st of December, maybe the 30th of November. Uh, and these um, are free to view, and they contain basically a, a really detailed breakdown of the climate conditions um, uh, why, you know, kind of the why behind the weather. There's a lot of background information in addition to the forecast. So the forecast, uh, we have rainfall on the left, we have temperature on the right, um, and what we can kind of see is an indication from the guidance that we take in at NIWA for the potential for below normal rainfall uh, for northern and eastern parts of the North Island. Uh, so that includes Northland and Auckland, the Waikato, Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Gisden, East Cape, Hawke's Bay, and down toward the Wairarapa. Those are the areas that have the highest chance of seeing below normal rainfall over that three month period. And when we do climate forecasting, it's not kind of a, a yes or a no, there's going to be above normal, there's gonna be below normal. Uh, because of the uncertainties that exist on those long forecast horizons, we've gotta break it down into three categories, and that's the chance of being below normal, the chance of being near normal, or, or the chance of being above normal. So sometimes we don't have the highest level of confidence for a particular region for, to be a single category. And when that happens, we kind of divide it up into an equal likelihood of two categories. Um, and that's what you're seeing here for the Western North Island, the Northern South Island, and the Eastern South Island, where normal or below normal rainfall over that three month period is about equally likely. And I guess the kind of the one of the best techniques to kind of deal with that uncertainty is the idea that above normal rainfall in those regions is pretty unlikely. It's the least likely outcome of the three. Um, so it may require just a little bit more planning or thinking that if I had normal rainfall, I'd probably be sweet. But if I didn't, I want to be prepared if that happens. So that's kind of the planning and preparation if you're maybe in one of those zones. Uh, just to think about, um, we've, you know, we've seen some, some uh, areas within those kind of three regions track a little bit drier lately. Um, and should that continue, uh, then, you know, we may see an escalation of the dryness and potential drought down the line. And the one region that we're pretty confident that rainfall will be uh, above normal is the Western uh, South Island, the Western and Lower South Island, which comprises the West Coast, uh, Southland and Inland Otago, um, parts of the Canterbury Headwaters and the High Country, uh, the Queenstown Lakes area, Stewart Island. Uh, this is an area that during El Nino episodes tends to be uh, wetter than normal, as the, t uh, the Southern Ocean tends to be a very busy place during El Nino episodes with plenty of fronts uh, moving into this area. And in fact, um, there could be a risk for uh, atmospheric rivers or even heavy rainfall in that region um, as we go through the, the months ahead. So we did see one of those in uh, late September. There was the flooding in Gore and parts of Southland, uh, and that um, could occur again at some point uh, in the months ahead. So that area is kind of the one exception uh, to the other parts of the country where above normal rainfall right now is looking, the chances for that pretty low. Now, as far as temperature goes, um, we've seen quite a bit of up and down variability in temperature through spring. As we look ahead to summer, what we're seeing is kind of a signal for more uh, northwesterly winds than normal. And you'll see an illustration of that in the next slide. Uh, and what that can do is occasionally transport these warm to hot air masses over from Australia 
uh, which warm up and dry out as they descend the central plateau in the North Island and the Southern Alps in the South Island. Um, and while we haven't seen it yet, um, there is probably an above average likelihood for temperatures to exceed 35 degrees in those eastern areas at some points during the summer season. Um, last summer, we didn't actually see a 35 degree temperature in New Zealand, believe it or not. So this year with the El Nino pattern and more probably more westerly winds, those eastern areas could go through some periods where there is maybe elevated heat stress. Um, and some really hot days and nights for that matter. Um, and the kind of the indication has been for, uh, originally we were seeing kind of a signal for more southwesterly winds in some of the guidance that we look at. And over time, it's kind of trended more northwesterly, uh, which can potentially introduce more humidity as well um, as we go into the summer season. So that is something to think about is that the humidity levels um, are likely to be on the rise. and There'll probably be some, some spikes in humidity as we go through the season, especially for uh, the North Island, um, which, you know, does sit uh, closer to uh, the tropics. So that is something to think about as well. But when you look at this map, the chance for a summer season that has below normal temperatures, that's the least likely outcome. And when we look uh, at creating these long-term outlooks, we're often looking at pressure patterns in the region. Um, so this map here shows the average pressure uh, pattern, the setup for the summer season, December through February. Uh, the red colors indicating higher than normal air pressure, the blue colors indicating lower than normal air pressure. And near New Zealand over the uh, summer season, what we see is a pretty strong signal for a high pressure belt here sitting near and north of the North Island. And the anti-clockwise flow around that high pressure system is what is likely to kind of fuel those uh, northwesterly winds, it kind of working in tandem with this low pressure system that's sitting in the Southern Ocean. So you can kind of start to see why we are favoring the potential for dryness in eastern areas because of the prevailing wind flow pattern. That circulation pattern is really the important the most important piece of the puzzle to try and get right on a seasonal scale, because if you get that right, chances are your temperature and rainfall forecast will, will kind of follow. And because of those kind of northwesterly winds, um, at times our air masses may kind of come down from the Coral Sea. And when that happens, western areas of the South Island, maybe even parts of the top of the South Island, especially Tasman or Nelson westward, uh, and potentially even the lower North Island areas like Taranaki, uh, could be exposed uh, to some of those moisture plumes. So um, th th that is kind of a, a risk, I would say, over the course of the summer season, is that um, what we could deal with are some some pretty dense moisture plumes that do track in from the tropics for especially western areas of the South Island, but not excluding areas that are a little bit farther north as well. And the picture for, this is February through April, so taking us through mid-autumn, it generally looks the same. The signal is not quite as strong, but it kind of speaks to that El Nino-like um, tail uh, favoring this area of high pressure near and north of the North Island into the autumn season. And as we'll see toward the tail end of the presentation, should dryness become a theme, the area that it's kind of most likely to persist in into autumn uh, is, generally speaking, the North Island when we look back at historical uh, El Nino episodes. Now, uh, another kind of key area or key variable that we look at is wind strength. Um, and this uh, summer season, we are seeing a signal for above normal wind speeds. Uh, and that is anything shaded in yellow or orange or red on the plots that you see here. So December to February on the left, February to April on the right. Uh, and we can really see those orange colors and red colors indicative of seasonal wind strength likely being above normal uh, for uh, uh, large parts of the country. And one of the elements with the wind strength um, uh, that can uh, quickly potentially lead to dryness is the fact that when we have stronger winds and warmer temperatures, uh, the tra evapotranspiration rates, the rate at which the water uh, is leaving the ground and leaving the plants into the atmosphere above, those can elevate quite quickly during those windy, hot periods. Um, so this is another thing to consider is the, even if rainfall has been kind of marginal and you're you know tracking maybe all right, if we do get into a windy, hot spell for even two weeks, 
uh, that can really change things in, in, in a quick way. So it's something to bear in mind that um, the information that we're receiving here is suggesting the season could be a bit windier than normal. Um, and from a you know, from a, a, I guess, a farming and agricultural perspective, that may mean one thing. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, we could be dealing with some potentially damaging wind events uh, as well uh, through the course of the season, maybe in the South Island. We saw several of those from about mid uh, September through a good chunk of October, several episodes of that, and there may be more of that to come. So now kind of getting closer to the end, we're just going to have a look at what the very latest seasonal climate model guidance is telling us. So each month on the 11th, NIWA takes in uh, data from international forecasting centers uh, all across the globe uh, and, and brings that into our system. And we basically understand what this means for New Zealand uh, from a rainfall perspective, what you see on screen. So those those nine those all those international centers they uh, each of them produces a forecast uh, and we consider that forecast kind of as an ensemble kind of a conglomerate of many different weather models and we can ask all of those individual weather models how many of these weather models are predicting a drier than normal summer season or a drier than normal February to April season and what is the percentage number of those models that have that particular outcome. So it's kind of a, a, a way of separating the, uh, really separating out the signal from the noise. So what regions of the country do we need to kind of really focus our attention on from a, a, a rainfall perspective uh, for the seasons ahead? And the coloring that you see here uh, indicates the percentage chance or number of ensemble members that are predicting below normal rainfall for each of the periods, December to Feb and Feb to April. And we can kind of see here that, again, it fits kind of the picture that we were looking at earlier, that if dryness, unusual dryness was to occur, the areas that are kind of most favored are those extending from Northland down to about Southern Hawks Bay, maybe into the Wairarapa. Um, that area has about a 50 to 60 percent chance of seeing below normal uh, seasonal uh, rainfall from December to February. And we do see a continuation of that theme in through the middle part of autumn here. So, again, those are the kind of the, the hot spots um, that we're you know, seeing on the, on the guidance. Uh, but there is still some shading right across the North Island. It's not a particularly high chance. I mean, 40 to 50 percent. Um, uh, as well as across kind of that northeastern corner of the South Island. Uh, but you'll see that, you know, you'll notice that much of the kind of rest of the South Island is blank in this case, uh, which does not indicate a high chance for below normal rainfall for those areas that are white or blank. Um, I'll say that the, I will add that the kind of the odds for dryness have backed off just a little bit. So one of the useful tools from a climate perspective is to look at last month's guidance and compare it to this month's guidance to understand how things are trending. Are they trending wetter? Are they trending drier? And we kind of have seen just a subtle easing in some of that dry signal for the summer. And again, I don't think it's a, a reason to be complacent, but I do think that it's kind of signaling that this El Nino is going to be just a little bit different than those ones we've seen in the past. And, and you know, that's referencing what we, what we looked at earlier. So, um, you know, I, I would say, I think, you know, you know, it, planning is and preparedness is, is still key, uh, but we have just seen kind of a subtle backing off of some of those the, the signals for really, really dry conditions have, have backed off just a little bit um, with the most recent run. This just came out uh, on the 11th. So this is actually really fresh information and hasn't even been considered. We'll be considering this in our summer outlook that we issue for uh, December to February at the end of this month. Similarly, we can look at the chance for rainfall being above normal using that same approach, and you can really see those areas that uh, for both December to February as well as February to April to uh, be on guard or on the lookout for the risk for heavy rainfall events, uh, and that extends from Tasman down through the West Coast, uh, even into parts of even into parts of eastern Otago, not just central Otago, and some of the fronts that do come across from time to time. Uh, they could even see some rain spill over the main divide, the, the Southern Alps, into parts of inland Canterbury, maybe even into eastern Otago. So um, that speaks to the wind strength, being able to transport some of that moisture over the, the barrier that is the Southern Alps. 
Um, so it does look like, again, uh, we need to be uh, prepared for the potential for some heavy rainfall events and maybe even flooding uh, in the regions that are, are shaded in green. And as I mentioned before, it might be hard to see, but even the lower North Island, Taranaki here, is shaded the very first tier of green, and that kind of speaks to the potential for some occasional northwesterly wind flows bringing moisture down from the tropics into the western uh, part of, of both islands, especially the South Island, but potentially even the North Island. And I think there's about three more slides to go. Um, what we have done is here is looked at all past uh, El Nino episodes dating back to the year 1972. Um, and we created these composites of rainfall patterns for uh, spring on the left, summer on the at center and autumn at right and the different colors in this case the orange and red colors uh indicates um regions that are that have historically had during past el nino episodes uh higher than a 60 percent chance for a drier than normal summer season or autumn season um or spring season during past el nino episodes so you can really see that during those past el nino episodes the Areas that are shaded in red, uh, eight out of every 10 El Ninos tends to produce below normal seasonal rainfall. So really seeing that across kind of Northland and the Coromandel, um, East Cape, uh, Gisborne as well, and, and some shading here for Southern Canterbury uh, as well in, in the red there. As we go to autumn, you can kind of see how that uh, signal for reduced rainfall kind of contracts and, and, and is kind of squeezed up toward the top of the country. Um, so if there are regions that uh, are likely to see the dryness persist into autumn, that is probably the, the places where you'd want to be focusing your attention. It's up toward the top of the country. Uh, and those El Nino events past tend to see some rain start to affect the South Island areas uh, during the autumn season, really not much of a dry signal there. Uh, for the El Nino uh, autumn. So this is a bit of historical context, and there is a document online, if you haven't seen, released from MPI. For, uh, there was messaging from a variety of, of sectors, um, uh, including some climate uh, info, and this is one of the contributions that um, uh, we provided. Uh, right, so lastly, some key messages that are apparently going out of order. Um, so, uh, you know, one of our kind of taglines, um, luck favors the prepared. This is one of the messages we've, we've uh, had in our um, many of our briefings. Um, I guess fa failing to plan is uh, 
preparing to fail, preparing to so whatever I just said. <laughs> I think I got it wrong, but failing to uh, plan is planning to fail. That's it. Um, so we know that uh, strong El Nino is underway with impacts lingering up likely until winter 2024. Um, what we've looked at is how this El Nino event is distinctly different from those past El Nino events. Uh, that we've seen, uh, and therefore the weather patterns that we experience here in New Zealand are likely to be a little bit different. So we can't just use those past experiences to necessarily guide us through uh, through this summer and, and autumn. There are no major issues yet in terms of dryness, but as discussed, things can change quickly. Uh, don't become complacent. Um, it's not looking like, you know, we're going to see a meteorological drought this side of Christmas. Um, however, there is a sign for some weeks to, to be drier than normal uh, looking ahead. And as we look to summer, that high pressure belt with the northwest winds, uh, prolonged dry spells will be possible, especially in those in northern and eastern parts of both islands. Um, but at the, by the same token, occasional northwesterly winds can tap into that tropical moisture and send it into some of the regions, especially there in the, uh, the western and inland South Island. Uh, the stronger than normal winds we uh, discussed, particularly in the South Island and the lower North Island, uh, that can increase the evapotranspiration rates. It can also increase the risk for some of those damaging wind episodes. Um, and those historical El Nino events have seen the signs and signals for dryness linger into the autumn in the North Island. Um, and lastly, you know, we know the average outcome of El Nino, but no El Nino is average, um, especially, I think, in the context of a change in climate when we have uh, above average ocean heat uh, basically everywhere. Um, but the predictive guidance and understanding of climate and weather has come a really long way. And in fact, that 1982-83 El Nino event is what kind of triggered a big international push to better understand uh, what uh, El, El Nino, La Nina, what ENSO means across the globe. Um, so we're really kind of, uh, I think, uh, reaping the rewards of a lot of that, a lot of that work over the last four plus decades. So uh, the information that we have now is just leaps and bounds ahead of, of where it was um, during those, those past uh, uh, strong events. And lastly, keeping track of forecast updates is critical. So we all have our favorite weather apps. Um, those are great. There's a lot that I shared today that you may not have known about that may be useful. Um, and as I mentioned, we at NIWA kind of receive these updates in near real time. So, uh, and, and I understand, I've heard that, you know, uh, certainly um, maybe you may be hearing something in the media and, and sometimes it can be presented in a way that may, it could sound extreme. So what I kind of would recommend is, is heading right to some of the primary sources that are available to understand how things are tracking or send an email out um, to your friendly forecaster or climate scientist. Uh, we're here to help. Um, I know some of those, sometimes the headlines can be a little bit frightening. So, um, uh, you know, by all means, there, there's a lot of information out there, uh, and you probably know your farm and paddock best. Um, and we're just kind of here to fill in some of the, the gaps with the weather, the weather and climate uh, and what's to come. So with that, I will end my recording. Um, and I'll, I guess, open it up to Angela and the floor. This did drag on a little bit longer maybe than I had intended, but I hope it was really interesting and useful. So uh, I will hit end on my recording here.